the question, inserting ourselves into the drama of today and asking ourselves the question, what is God saying to us by the everyday events of our life? We begin to read the newspapers and the news magazines with the idea that here indeed is the revelation of the word of God for us at the end of the 20th century. We read with that kind of faith. We read with the eyes of faith and we find out that in understanding what's happening in the world around us, we can hear God speaking to us, telling us what's important, just as Elizabeth Seton did in her day. Theological reflection, to my mind, in this model answers the question, having heard what God is saying, what are we going to answer? Theological reflection makes it possible for us to say, what is God asking of me? And then, of course, the minute that you start to think about that in the context of the realities of our time, and I use the word reality here in the liberation theology context, you begin to do action. This word here could be action. For those of us who are a little older, you may recall this very same drama as see, judge, act. And, uh, and I believe that this is the kind of theological basis that Elizabeth would certainly use if she were here today. And the one thing that she would do as she looked with the eyes of faith is to know that we live in a moment of extreme transformation. We, are, we live in a transformative moment, perhaps unequaled in the history of humankind. Global transformation is occurring whether you want it to or not. Organizations are transforming madly. Many of you who are in, for example, healthcare know this on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the other organizations, unfortunately, are not transforming rapidly enough and consequently becoming daily more fossilized and less relevant and less useful and totally dysfunctional in many cases. And, and then you have, of course, personal transformation. Now, these drive each other. And so the more people become personally transformed, the more they are driven to change the organizations of which they are parts so that they do not fossilize. And then all of us are driven to be able to do the one and only thing that we have the power to do at this moment of history. We really can't stop the global transformation which is occurring. It's like a giant whirlwind and it's going. The only thing we have the power to do is to help determine the direction. The direction of the transformation is determined by choices, by human choices. Which direction will we go as a people? Which direction will we go? We have the ability, if you wish, to take the message of the gospel and make sure that it informs the future. Mother Seton would have understood that. And one of the first things that she would have known is that we live in this world. Nothing smaller. None of us can possibly continue to think that our address is 208 Main Street, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Just not true. We live here on the whole thing. And because it is a finite reality as such as it is, I come to you today not as the speaker, but as the spokesperson for the earth which is coming to talk to you, coming to address you and to say, I need you. I need everybody in here to really get on the ball and see what we can do to make a better world than the one we have been having. So remember, this is really the star of the show here. This happens to be a globe which is made from pictures from the earth from space. As you notice, it's missing about half the cloud cover but in order to be able to see it, they peel that off. And so what you'll notice is that it is, doesn't have any boundaries. You notice what we're used to on globes, no boundaries. This is the way it looks from space. In a certain sense, science is enabling us through what I call revelation according to NASA, the National Aviation and Space Agency, we are able to see ourselves in a way that we never even dreamed to actually look and see where we fit. Now, the major agenda of Homo sapiens in the next 20 years is to try to figure out what is our role? Because to, to date, we have not yet discovered the appropriate role of Homo sapiens in this drama. 
I'll pass this around because I, I want you to be able to see what the Earth really looks like. <laughs> Back in uh, 1948, long before people were going to uh, space in ships, Sir Fred Hoyle, who's a British astrophysicist and something of a philosopher, made the following amazing prophecy. And I'm using that term in the biblical sense. A fabulous prophecy. Once a photograph of the Earth taken from the outside becomes available, a new idea. As powerful as any in history, I might say maybe more powerful than any in history will let loose. And that idea is what we are passing around right here, that we live on this very tiny little piece of the universe. And that everything on that is absolutely connected to everything else. So that if there's something wrong somewhere, there's something wrong everywhere. And if the responsibility for whatever's wrong belongs here, it also belongs there. There's no getting out of the responsibility. So this is very, very important. It's, it's providing us with a tremendous challenge that humans have never had before. We are being given larger responsibilities than we have ever, ever imagined, which must mean that we must be growing up a bit. And so the great eternal creator has put us here at a time when we have bigger, bigger challenges to meet. The other thing that's exciting about this, if, uh, let's see, is uh, anybody up there that turns on that machine? Where's my young friend? Well, turn it on in the back. See that switch in the back? Just flip it up. There's a little light switch like in the back. Flip, flip it all the way up. Here, 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 Pat will get it. I don't think it's on, so I didn't, is it? It's on. Oh, it is, I'm sorry, it's on. Okay, here's the same picture. Just wanting to get you to see it and realize what that means. And then to realize something else, which is one of my favorite pictures. This is a, a picture from the National Aviation and Space Agency of the US Space Program. And a very important picture. This is one of my very favorite pictures. Look at that picture carefully and see if you see anything familiar. Other than the, than the space suit. Anything familiar in there? Over there, American flag on his sleeve, but that could be Russian or European. There's different space groups. What do you see? I think he's going to get some of the lights down. Anybody notice over there? There's a little rim of blue, kind of curved. Guess what? Home. Home. This, this guy or gal is gone far away from home and happens to have stepped out of his space capsule with his back to the Earth. See, it's a dramatic picture. With his back to the Earth. Now, what I ask you is, you zip yourself into that suit right now. You are this astronaut. And where are you? You're trailing behind a space capsule out here that's going 17,500 miles an hour. And there's not a single sound. Absolute silence, 17,500 miles. Every 90 minutes you go around, look down, there's Halifax. 90 minutes you look down, there's Halifax. 90 minutes around the Earth. You're going 17,500 miles an hour. That's you up there. Notice that you have taken Earth with you. That exceedingly expensive suit that the American public has paid for is nothing but a little Earth. And notice something else very important. This person cannot be up there by him or herself, right? How many people are actually involved in having this person up here? Thousands, thousands, literally, tens of thousands if you go into the research piece and all of that. So what are we getting here? An interesting model for the future. We cannot go it alone. One of the most important lessons is the lesson taught by the Earth itself, by the living creatures on the Earth itself. There is no such thing as an individual organism, not in any meaningful sense with continuity. Living creatures exist only in what ecolo in ecology we call communities. Isn't that an interesting word? That's a scientific word, the way I'm using it. It's an ecological term. 
We can only live in communities. Don't you think that this person better be on pretty good terms with whoever inside that space capsule has his or her hand on the oxygen tank? And whoever has a hand on the switch that's keeping the suit warm? I think so, otherwise he's a cosmic ice cube in a matter of no time. So what do we find then? What does this bring us to? Let me suggest to you, let's assume that you are there going around every 90 minutes. I want to share with you what some of the astronauts, what has happened to them up there. These people, for the most part, are, uh, went up, you know, they're engineers and test pilots and other similar types. Sultan bin Sulman al Saud of Saudi Arabia, who's a prince and also a test pilot, was up in one of the European missions that was up there for about 10 days. And he said the following amazing thing. The first day or so, we pointed to our countries. The third day, we found ourselves pointing to our continents. By the fifth day, we were aware of only one Earth. Now think about that. All those divisions that we have in our heads were gone by seeing the truth every 90 minutes. A German, uh, Sigmund Jahn, said, before I flew, I was already aware of how small and vulnerable the planet is. The engineer, he knew all the data, you know? He knew all the sizes. But only when I saw it from space, in all its ineffable beauty and fragility, did I realize that humankind's most urgent task is to cherish and preserve it for future generations. I would say that's a fairly spiritual response, wouldn't you? And one of, uh, one of the Americans who was up there during the Christmas period said, the earth reminded us of a Christmas tree ornament hanging in the blackness of space. And listen to the adjectives. That beautiful, warm, living object looked so fragile, so delicate, that if you touched it with a finger, it would crumble. Seeing this has to, I should know this by now, seeing this uh, has to change a person, has to make a person appreciate the creation of God and the love of God. This is all coming down over the NASA wires. And finally, one of our men, Edgar Mitchell, who's a man of fewer words, said, my first view of our planet was a glimpse of divinity. So there is a very interesting connection here between science and religion. And we see it to some extent in the next slide, which being an old a biology teacher, I put here because I think the analogy with the preceding slide is fairly obvious. Do you notice? And we're all aware of the fact that an infant, of course, a fetus, a seven, six, seven month old human fetus, is completely dependent on that mother for life in just the same way that that astronaut was completely dependent on the friends and the people down in Houston and all the various thousands of people that are involved in that. So what do we, what is there to learn from this, from this slide? What is there to learn about? To learn about this is to find that perhaps we as a human race have only begun, have only begun to try to discover what it is we're supposed to be doing when we grow up. Because at the present time, the human race, I'm done with that, yeah. The human race is largely, um, I can get rid of that, but I don't want it to burn the whole time. The human race is very, has been acting, at least, as far as we can tell, for the last 30,000 years or so, rather like adolescents, terribly adolescent behaviors. And so what we're being asked now at this moment in history is whether or not we're willing to grow up. If we grow up, we make it. If we don't grow up, we won't make it. And so I think that's really an interesting moment. Take a look at this. According to uh, this author who's talking about the human story, we have here and now, and we have a period starting called the planetary era of human life. We have just come through the last approximately 10,000 years, the age of empire, from the time of the, of the agricultural revolution, here about 10 to 12,000 years, that's usually given as, I usually say 10, that's 10,000 years. That's the only time we even talk about. We always think of this period back here as before history, right? You know, that's primitive times. How long was this? Notice that I have question marks here and it goes back, back, back. How long since the first humans actually? 
Well, generally, depending on who you read and which you like, two to three million years. Two to three million years since Homo, the genus Homo, established itself on the Earth. That means that you have to take 200 pieces this long and stick them together and make this blue line go out there through the next two walls. Very, very, very long period, during which people did what? Cooperated amazingly and lived in harmony with nature. You know, we often think of these folks back here as sort of, what's the stereotype? Yeah. Go, gami. Think about what they did with absolutely nothing. They had nothing. They had nothing. They were really smart. How many of us put out in the middle of the wilderness somewhere in your birthday suit would even survive for a week? Not too many. So these were not stupid people. And what was important was, guess why they survived? Because they did not even understand themselves as individuals. They were parts of a clan tribe group. They knew that they were part of a whole that was bigger than the sum of its parts. And some way or another, during this period, we lost that and became extremely individualistic and competitive. Here we had been extremely communal and collaborative. The human race will not make it for any length of time in the future unless we develop a new form of collaborative communal living only way that we're going to be able to do it. Now that is a huge order and what it means is that we are in a moment of history now when everything is, can be new for us. It's an exciting idea. It's kind of scary in a way but it's very very exciting because we are here in the early morning perhaps of understanding our place in the universe. Just beginning to figure out maybe what do humans, what are humans supposed to be doing? What is our appropriate role in this amazing drama into which we have entered only in the last second of geological time? You know, the, 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 if you take, uh, um, what's his name? The famous, uh, well, it doesn't come to me. Anyway, he's got the, the whole of creation in one year since the Big Bang. Guess what time fire is invented, which would make fairly, fairly sophisticated humans, fairly sophisticated, still very, very caveman, but sophisticated. 11.46 p.m. on December the 31st of a year. Yes. And actually, modern humans are like 11.59.59. 59. This piece here, this story here that we call history was 1159.59. We have been here. Homo sapiens, modern humans, 40,000 years, have been here for one half of a second. Now, what that suggests to us then is to get out of the arrogant posture which we have taken relative to the rest of creation and come to understand that reverence is the appropriate posture, that awe is the way by which we will be able to enter into kinship, the kinship which is part of the way we're made by the great creator. We will enter into that and we will re-inhabit the planet as members of a, of a sacred earth community, as Thomas Berry calls it. And he suggests either humans go into the future to gather with the natural world forming a sacred community where we both perish in the desert. I think it's very important to look at that. Now, Mother Seton then and anyone else who is willing to really, really look at the reality to understand what God is trying to tell us by the events of our time would have realized that there are some very serious problems socially within the human community and again from Gaudium et Spes, I would, I would bring you this meditation to think about. God destined the earth and all it contains for all peoples 
And if this were being written now, 30 years later, not only for all peoples, but what? For all created beings. We have to expand that. We're being invited to expand that so that all created things would be shared fairly by humankind under the guidance of justice tempered by charity. Well, if we're going to be willing to look at the reality in which we live, then we have to understand something that is marvelously put forth by a seven-year-old girl in El Paso, or nine. She's nine years old. Read this analysis of the present situation from a nine-year-old. I don't know about you, but I consider that to be pretty profound. And notice how she connects the destruction with the hurricanes and tornadoes. That's an amazing insight, an amazing insight, even for an adult, let alone for a nine-year-old. And then her final, very simple, like children, you know, everything's black and white for kids. I am the ill earth. If you trash me, I'll die. So will you. Interesting. Another way of putting that same message, we have a wonderful cartoonist in Cincinnati, Jim Borgman, Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist two, three years ago, political cartoonist, who did this on the one year anniversary of curbside recycling in Cincinnati. Do you have curbside recycling of the various things? Okay, this is a year after he had this very interesting and profound comment to make. Here is, a, here is a man who has taken his civic duty, his new civic duty seriously. He's coming out there with his little stuff. But he looks around and says, oh, you know, what tech difference does this make in that system? And so we really need to look at this, folks, because not only from an environmental perspective, as Jacques clearly indicated, the, the North American, actually the, the developed world, including Canada, the United States, and, and Europe, and Japan, all of the consumer nations, if you wish, those of us who have become consumers of the global marketplace, big time, need right now, if we were to extend our way of living to everyone, there need to be three Earths right now. That's with only six billion people. By the year 2025, there'll be eight billion people, folks. So we need another one. So by 2025, we need four Earths. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a feeling we're not going to get any more Earths. That's my, my intuition. Consequently, this is it. So we either learn how to live on it or we get evicted. From a social justice perspective as Christians, very important that we look at what God is trying to tell us by the realities of our time. According to World Watch Institute in Washington, which is a very good think tank that doesn't have any access to grind and does their homework really well, very credible group, they suggest something that I think is good for us to ponder. It makes more sense to divide humanity into classes according to the amount of consumption rather than to divide them geographically into first world and third world, as we now do the north and the south, the rich world and the poor world. Because in the rich world, there are many poor people. And in the poor world, there are a few scandalously rich people. So it's not a good division. Let's find out. What do we each cost the planet? Let's start to do planetary cost accounting. And if you do planetary cost accounting in the context of faith, what you come up with is an informed conscience that necessitates a significant drop in consumption, which, by the way, will be wonderful for most of our health, be wonderful for our social uh, systems that are falling apart because families are broken up to a large extent by people that are out working in order to buy a lot of stuff that nobody needs, et cetera, et cetera. I think you get the point. We'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. The World Watch Institute suggests the following groupings, which I think are really good to think about. I want you to read those carefully. Meditate on this table, and I'm using that term in the appropriate sense. They've taken the major things we use in our everyday life, what we eat, our transportation methods, and everything else we use, everything else we use in your everyday life, and divided the people of the Earth into three groups. About 20% consumers, about 60% kind of middle, and 20% terribly poor. 
Read those carefully and tell me where you see the healthiest human lifestyle. What, what looks the healthiest up there to you? How many think the middle? Absolutely, it's clear. It jumps off the page at you, right? And, and, and this, this, met, this particular lifestyle here is as harmful in its own way to humans as this one, where people do not even have enough to eat. It is, it is as harmful, only, only what has it become? If you want to think of it this way, the American dream is the way it's often given probably the Canadian dream too, but the, the consumer society dream of what the good life is. It isn't a good life. We're fooling ourselves. We're poisoning ourselves. We're, 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 we're ruining our hearts and blood vessels. I mean, it's really a damaging lifestyle. When will we acknowledge that? What do people have to do to maintain this lifestyle? Everybody in the family has to work. There's no time to talk to each other. We don't have time to eat together. Everybody's on the run. I'm pretty sure that's true up here, as well as down in our area, because I, I know some Canadians. So when I speak of these, I think we're pretty, we're pretty much the same. Now, from a social justice perspective, as serious Christians, look at this in the context of that quotation that I just started this section with, about God has destined the earth for all of the people to be shared with justice and charity. You will notice that if you take the 100% of the world's people, right now 6 billion, and you take the 1.2 billion 20 that are the, the, the t richest, that the richest 20% have 83% of the total goodies of the earth. And then the next bat, the next 20% have nearly 12. So that if you add those two together, you find out that 40% of the world's people, which is primarily the people living in, in the developed world, in the industrialized world, have 95% either use or control 95% of the Earth's goods, leaving 5% for the other 60% of our brothers and sisters. Now that's a terribly sobering thought, and for any of us who are willing to form a conscience around this, we must reach the stage where the ethical system within our spirituality has to say, I cannot live, I cannot continue to tolerate, to live in a world like this. I must do whatever I can to move us toward something a little bit resembling justice. So what we find out then is something that this cartoon that a Marion brother that I know in Dayton did, which I think tells it very, I'm sorry that these things wear out on me and I hadn't realized that. He said, one of these guys is saying to the other, I'm sure glad the hole is not at our end of the boat. <laughs> now ponder that for a moment in terms of what I suggested to you about how we really live on that planet. It doesn't make any difference where the hole is, folks, especially since we have made the hole to a very large extent. We've made the hole. We, the industrial consumer nations, make the hole there's the people back there. They are not in a position to even plug the hole. So if that hole's going to get plugged before it gets too late, who's going to have to do it? We are. And it's only right and just that we do it. So these are big things. These are things that if you're really looking at the realities of our time and you're willing to look at them bravely, we can see the agenda for tomorrow. We'll be talking about that tomorrow, looking at the, at the morning pretty much, at the actual environmental realities and what they mean, especially in terms of food. We, we're in a very serious situation globally in terms of food in the next 30 years. And, uh, and then uh, in, the after, in the evening tomorrow, uh, a lecture entitled Hope Through Alternatives. Because if you look at these things, all you want to do sometimes is go home and just bury your head. But that's not the way humans are made. We're made in the image of God. Guess what? We're being called to prove that and to prove that one of the things about the divine that we can mimic is creativity. We can be creators of a different kind of world. And that's what I'll be talking to you about tomorrow night because I build solar houses. And so uh, I've built two solar buildings at this point. I live in one and one of them is my learning center. And Cincinnati is 
as gray during the winter as it was early this morning and later this afternoon, all winter long. And we heat our building, and it's fairly cold. We heat our building with solar heat from the preceding summer. Think about it. Guess what the bill is? What's the bill at the end of the month? Well, a little, because we have electric pumps that run the, heat, run the, the thing around. But eventually, when I get enough money, we won't have a bill because I'm going to put up photovoltaic panels which will make the electric power that will run the pumps. So eventually we'll have a lovely learning center with no utility bills and almost no pollution. Now if I, starting at the age of, how old was I when I did that, uh, 59, if I could start a, to get involved in a building like that, I started my solar enterprises when I was 50. If I could get into that, never having done anything but teach biology, and now I can both design and construct a solar building with my hands, then anybody can do anything. And if you can, if you can, if you can heat a building in Cincinnati, Ohio with sun in the winter, then you can do it anywhere because it is cloudy. So that's just a preview of coming attractions to show you that hope will be generated by our own realization of what it is we can do if we want to. And it will make for community, it will make for interdependence, and it will make for all the things that we have thrown out in the last uh, three or four decades. I want to look at something else that's a little bit, um, little bit sobering. In the book Awakening Earth, you know this afternoon when I was getting this, I was going through these again to make sure I cannot to save me remember the man's name. I hope it will come to me before I, I finish with this series. But it's a marvelous book, Awakening Earth, in which he takes, he's one of these big picture futurists, and uh, takes all of human history, including future history, and puts it into eight phases. And he suggests that we are currently in stage four. Now. This is gro the growth pattern of the life cycle of in Western industrial civilization. Now that's big. That's a big idea. But let's look at it. Because sometimes it helps to see a picture of something that you're actually experiencing. And I'd be willing to bet that if you study this with me, I know a lot of people don't like graphs, but don't let them bother you. If you study this with me, I think you will see a picture of something that you're actually experiencing every day in your life, that you're actually seeing. Follow this with me and see if it's not true. In any organization, in any organization, you end up with a first stage in which there's very high growth very much enthusiasm, very high energy, lots of, uh, of zeal and excitement. And it goes bananas. It grows fast. And then it continues to grow here, and it becomes full blossoming and grows into a mature whatever. And eventually down here, you begin to get a kind of a status quo, business as usual. Anybody ever experienced that? kind of a business as usual, and business as usual doesn't work. Business as usual begins to die as soon as it's business as usual. And so you begin already a decline in the energy, in the excitement, in the vigor of whatever this group is that you have, and sooner or later it will reach the stage of breakdown and at this point, according to this author, whose name I'm terribly sorry, I've even met the man. Um, I can't remember his name right now. You reach this stage right here. He is suggesting that that's where we are, in the early stages of breakdown. And of course, what that means is that we have options if we recognize that this is where we are. It's like the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. When you are in the gutter with your face down against the pavement and you're willing to acknowledge it, you may be able to get up. Do you follow? You may be able to be helped to get up. And so we stand, I would suggest to you, right at this moment in human history. And it is a very exciting time to be alive because we have the opportunity to construct a world that could be peaceful and just and clean, ecologically healthful, if we want to. Business as usual will undoubtedly 
lead to this pattern, undoubtedly. Now, another way of looking at that is, I think, kind of interesting because it's similar to something we already know from experience. You have spring. We live in the temperate zone, so we all experience this every year. We have spring, nice new green leaves, everything beautiful and fresh, and then summer, and you have lots and lots of blossoming and things. And then now, where are we? Well, here we are in autumn, and the leaves pretty soon are going to be gone, and pretty soon it begins to look pretty wintry. But what happens in nature? This happens. Here's next spring, and next summer, and next, do you follow? Because in, in nature, everything is cyclic. It doesn't just go and then end. We don't live on a flat earth. We live on a round earth, as we found out some centuries ago. So we have to see that what we have here is going from an era when faith was very high to a kind of age of reason where we fi humans figure, well, we've got it all under control now. We don't need God. Did we go through this historically, I think? You know, we don't need God. We can do it. Science can do it. And then we come to a place here where, well, hey, science maybe isn't really able to do it. What about all that beef that's full of bacteria? And, the, you know, you start getting all these scientific things that tell you that science may not have all the answers. And then you end up with despair, which we have a lot of on our planet today, don't we? There's a tremendous amount of despair, especially among the young, which is tragic, because they are the future. And if they're despairing, we're in big trouble, folks. And so we have to figure out ways to get people out of this despair that they are presently suffering. So we have, what we need to understand then is that we have choices. And every day that goes by, our options become more limited. Pretty soon, there won't be choices. Do you follow? In terms of environmental and social change. We can either opt for a new springtime or we can go into this stage of breakdown and eventual collapse. And it's conceivably possible that if the Western industrial model continues unabated, that this could, could happen, you could get this line all the way down to the absolute bottom, not long after the beginning of the 22nd century. In other words, we might make it this way through 100 years with extreme deterioration and, and dreadful, dreadful circumstances to live in. <coughs> In that same book, this author shows us <coughs> what happens from one stage to the next in terms of human dynamics. And I think this is just one of the best things that I have ever seen. What he shows us is that as you go from, these, from stage one to stage four, you end up with an increasing bureaucratic complexity. Lots of bureaucracy. Lots of uh, pyramidal, you know, uh, plans of, of management. But most important, this is what I want to concentrate on. What is constantly falling? Shared social vision. Shared social vision. What makes the early stages of this of any organization, of the growth of anything, look like this, rapid, high energy changes, is what? Tremendous shared social vision. People with a similar vision of what the meaning of life is, of what's important, people with similar values, as has characterized the beginnings of most organizations all the way up to and including nations. Shared vision patriotic vision, if you wish, to think in terms of the civic community of which any one of us is a part. Tremendous love for, energy toward, hard work, all the kinds of things that we have gotten so lazy about in the last 50, 45, 50 years, especially since World War II. That has been the, the, the area, the time, I believe, when this decline really began. And so shared social vision is something that is within our control, is it not? To redevelop shared social vision. What vision do we need to develop this around? The global commons, which is the only place we can live, folks. This is the only place we have. This is our only home. 
Ecology, you know, is the science that the Greek word ecology comes from, I mean, ecology comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home or household. Did you know that? So ecology is the study of home, the study of household. And what we really need to become is home economists. We need to develop a new home economics, global home economics, which will bring us to a healthier state all the way around. And we can do this if we want to, because if we do not do it, the future of society in, on this planet is, is pretty endangered. We can either opt, this is suggesting that approximately 2025 you will begin to seriously make one of these choices. Either mutually assured development, in other words, what? A new springtime. A new springtime. A new springtime at this point is still possible. 10 years from now, it'll be less possible. 20 years from now, it'll be less possible. 30 years from now, it'll be less possible. And by 40 years from now, according to many people, it may or may not be possible. So you and I, many of us, are going to live during the period when humanity makes this choice. We can have stagnation, which is business as usual, but actually that line way out here will not stay flat. It will go And we can have collapse very early if we don't do anything. Well, we're already doing some things. So apparently we, we've chosen away from, away from total collapse, but not very seriously yet. The amount of seriousness that we need to devote to this is gigantic. I was fortunate in being at the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit in 1992, and that whole meeting, 14 days, was basically devoted to looking at a study that had been done by the Commission on Environment and Development that was headed up by Gro uh, Brundtland, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the female prime minister of Norway, who had, was, had, a, had a great deal to do with the leadership of that commission and out of which came the Earth Summit, which has not been, it's not being implemented at all with the speed with which many of us hoped it would, but it's there and it's tickling lots of people at this point trying to do something. The important thing that was learned at that, at that meeting is something we need to learn about. Our global future, our, who's our? Right now it's six billion people, our global future. We have to think about that, not Canada or the US, but our global future, either we're all gonna make it together, we're not gonna make it. Our global future depends on sustainable development. You've, have you heard that term? You're gonna hear it a lot. What do you mean by sustainable development? Well, you all know how the word development is used in the international sense. Development suggests the improvement of people's lifestyle to, in some of the cases, at least meet basic human needs for health, education, et cetera, housing, food, enough food to eat. That's what we've been meaning by development. It's an economic term. It's a term from economics. I don't believe that it's at all a good term because there are many, many people in the so-called underdeveloped world who are very much more developed than we are humanly. They just don't have much. But we need to look at what's important. And sustainable is a word that what rang through the entire uh, Rio summit. Sustainable development, to be a sustainable future. It has to be a future in which the way we live now does not endanger the possibility of coming generations to be able to live appropriately, which will require great changes. We have to change the way we live now if future generations are gonna be able to do it. We're gonna expand on this tomorrow quite a bit and look at population and, and food especially because they're in, in 45 minutes or an hour, we don't have time to look at a whole lot, but we will be looking at population and food in the morning and then at possible solutions in the afternoon, basically around uh, some of the energy things and some of the kinds of environmental changes that we can make, which will be to our enormous benefit as humans, in addition to providing for a better world for the future, for future generations. But sustainable development then is something we have yet to invent. The development models that presently are utilized through the international community, the World Bank, et cetera, are, are all models that destroy the earth. They're automatically industrial models and consequently they're all destructive. So we have to get away from those and invent new ones. 
We have to invent sustainable development. And what do we mean? What do we mean to, what, what is it going to take to do that? As it suggests here, it depends on our willingness. Now that's an important word, our willingness and our ability. We have the ability. In the, in the industrial world, we have the ability. That's a given. Are we going to be willing to dedicate? That's a word you hardly ever see anymore in English prose. Hardly ever see it. Dedicate. To dedicate what? Our intelligence, our ingenuity, our adaptability, and our energy. To put ourselves wholeheartedly into the development of a common future. All six to eight billion people, a common future. And a way to think about that as Christians is to remember that the other time every day when we use the word our, is I think most everybody probably at some point says the our father every day. And how many of us, when we make that prayer, really include six billion people, of which one billion do not have enough to eat or drink? Our brothers and sisters. See, if we have our father, if it's a common father or parent, then what? All six billion of those are brothers and sisters. Woo! That's heavy. Isn't it? Pretty soon there'll be 8 billion. So we have to make room in our hearts and in our concerns and in our in the ethical behavior patterns that we develop. In other words, in the formation of our own consciences relative to what is, what is required of a Christian as we turn the page into the 21st century. We are required, much more is required of us than we have been willing to admit. And it is going to require sacrifice, as we usually use that term, but it is also going to produce liberation. We will be free. You see, the consumer society, to a very large extent, produces an enormous slavery. Would you agree that consumerism is fundamentally enslaving? What do you think? So it's an enslavement. We may not realize it, but you truly are trapped because many of the things that we do, we do because we got to do them. That means you're trapped. That means you're not free. You got to do it because this, that, or the other reason is pushing you.